All right, everybody. So I'm pretty excited because today I've got a lot of things that I love in front of me. I've got um, my favorite uh, ginger ale comes in from Australia, Bundaberg. I think it's Bundaberg. Uh, no idea how to say it. I've got a fantastic avocado that I cannot wait to turn into some guacamole. Probably going to eat that while I'm editing. And uh, it's, it's Star Wars t-shirt day. Um, by the way, only the original trilogy is canon. I don't recognize any of the rest of it. Um, that's, that's very kind of theologian of me right there, but, um, <clears throat> there's something that I cannot stand that absolutely drives me nuts. Right. And what drives me nuts is when I hear what I like to call biblical language folklore. Um, and that's when a preacher comes out and they will just kind of, they'll, they'll parrot something that they've probably heard somewhere else. And it, it has nothing to do with the passage itself. It's misleading. They're, mis they're misunderstanding how an actual Greek term is used. I was really fortunate uh, that I, during my seminary years, I got to be a TA for a couple of years in uh, the Greek department. So I got to deep dive into a lot of Greek. Double-edged sword, it's, it, it made me really good at being able to exegete Greek, but at the same time, I can't sit through a sermon that has Greek in it and probably not catch uh, various errors that are that are going on. So I want to help you guys pr avoid doing some of those errors yourself and show you guys how I avoid some of those errors. Or at least I'm going to tell you the, the resources I use to avoid those errors uh, and which ones that you can use to avoid it too. So I've split it up into New Testament and um, Old Testament. Uh, New Testament, of course, being pr predominantly in Greek and Old Testament pr predominantly being in um, Hebrew, although I'm going to give you a recommendation on the Septuagint as well. All right, so the New Testament, I like to base off of a um, an interlinear, and the interlinear I like to use is the SBL. I think the SBL is really kind of the gold standard of, of critical texts when it comes to putting the manuscripts together. Uh, so I use... Logos Bible software. I think every pastor really should consider using Logos Bible software. I think it's just the gold standard in the industry, and I think it's the one you should use. So I use the Lexham English, uh, sorry, Lexham Greek English Interlinear New Testament Bible, the SBL edition. So that's that's the one I'm usually working in when I want to confirm uh, some sort of Greek feature or uh, grammar. Um. The next, the next resource that I think everybody really should have would be the BDAG. Uh, that's what it's more commonly known as, but you'll, you would see it as a Greek English lexicon of the New Testament and other early Christian literature. Again, that's the BDAG. Um, the next one, uh, and largely the BDAG is just used for uh, word studies, um, but, it, but it helps a little bit with definitions and things like that. Similarly, uh, a Greek English lexicon, the LSJ, as, as we usually refer to it. The next one would be the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament or the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, the abridged version. Um, and those are regularly referred to as the TDNT or the TDNTA. Um, I usually just go with the, with the regular uh, TDNT. Um, and that one's great because, it, like, say you want to go learn about the term agape or agapa, agapao, right? Uh, which generally is translated love. And you really want to deep dive into that one. The TDNT, it's going to give you massive long article with the usage uh, f all the way from, you know, early, early Greek. It's going to tell you usage in the Septuagint. It's going to tell you usage in... Um, you know, second temple literature. It's going to tell you all kinds of new Testament literature, Jesus's usage. It's going to go into it in a lot of depth. And so it's a really great resource. Um, and that's a great one to help you help prevent you from espousing some of these nonsensical things where you, you come out and you make some, some kind of assertion about a word that's just not, not nearly the usage that it's ever actually had. Um, when you move in to more of the grammar, I find it really helpful to have um, the Greek grammar beyond the basics, and it's subtitled An Exegetical Syntax of the New Testament, and that's by Wallace. 
A lot of you will probably have had that in seminary. It's a really popular uh, teaching text for like intermediate Greek. Um, I find that one really helpful just to even, I, I've almost always got it in a tab in my, um, my Logos when I'm just working with any, uh, any, any part of the New Testament uh, and usually the Septuagint as well. Uh, because like, let's say I'm working with some errorists or something and I want to determine, you know, Greek is a spectral. So I want to determine, is this a certainty in the future? And that's why it's, it's, it's using this action completed kind of verb. Is it something that is sure and, and happens as a general rule within, within life. And it's, it's talking about kind of the present and, and, and all times. Or is it something that was in the past and is finished and done? Um, and that's going to make a difference sometimes to, to how you approach passages and, and how you um, exegete them for, for your congregation, uh, especially if you get into, um, I mean, eschatology, obviously, it has a lot of a lot of impact there. But any kind of prophecy, anything anything like that, uh, those will impact quite a bit. Um, and and you'll, you'll pick up those kinds of things off of uh, Wallace's... Uh, grammar. Um, similarly, because it can be kind of hard to take Greek and determine some of those, um, some of those categorize that grammar. I find it can be helpful to have the uh, Lexham SGNT notes, SBL edition, the expansions and annotations. So when you have that open, it'll actually categorize every single word and show you how they categorized um, categorize them at least at least for the Lexham English Bible um, so that that can be helpful to to give you kind of a starting point uh, from which you can analyze it so really really recommend that one uh, moving on down into Hebrew um, again I think it's really helpful to work with an interlinear especially if it's been a long time since you uh, had to take like basic Hebrew uh, so here, I, I like to use the Lexham Hebrew English Interlinear Bible, uh, and that one's based on the Masoretic, so that's pretty pretty standard. Um, I also like to have a Septuagint available uh, because Septuagint is actually actually older uh, than the than the Masoretic text, so it, it can it can be really interesting to kind of look and compare. Um, especially if you want to have, have some interest, go, go and look at the various ways in which um, David's kind of origin story uh, pops up between Masoretic text and Septuagint texts. Because there's, there's really like three or four different kind of tellings of how um, Saul and David meet. Um, and so it's, it's just interesting that they've kind of kept, kept and preserved them all and how they, all, how they kind of compare. Um, so there, there's various things like that. You generally they they agree, but every once in a while it can be helpful to kind of look at them and compare. You know how how tall did these other texts say that that David was versus how tall does the Masoretic say that David was, or, or that uh, Goliath was? You know you can, you can kind of jump in and compare these things. Uh, but anyway, that's a tangent. I'm gonna, jumping back into just the the uh, Hebrew itself. Um, very helpful to have. The NIDOT uh, is what we commonly call it, but it is, stands for the New International Dictionary of Old Testament Theology and Exegesis. Um, that one, it's really helpful just because, yeah, it shows you where some of these terms are used, kind of a, a generic meaning of them, things like that. Um, next one would be the, the Halot, uh, and the Halot is the Hebrew Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament. Uh, and that one dives a little bit further into uh, etymologies, how the, how words are used, things like that. Um, finally, again, it makes sense to have, keep a grammar on hand. And the grammar I like to use here is a biblical reference, uh, sorry, a biblical Hebrew reference grammar. Uh, and that one's by Vandermeer. Uh, and a lot of you probably had to study, uh, you know, even basic Hebrew off of uh, Vandermeer's uh, workbook and textbook, um, and it's 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 kind of a gold standard as well uh, in in Hebrew education. So I, I really recommend jumping into that one um, and pay attention to the to kind of like the the latter sections because he actually puts some some really helpful notes. Um, 
in places that you wouldn't expect uh, with, within his, his grammar. Um, so I, I picked up some things that, that uh, definitely changed the way that I approach uh, most of the major and minor prophets, as well as like Psalms and things like that. Uh, if I see certain grammatical features towards the end of one, then I kind of know, okay, this, even though this looks like it should be, and usually we translate this as past tense, I know for sure that this is a, a future certainty because, because when it's here, it's proleptic. So you'll pick up on these kinds of things uh, and be able to use them. Uh, and it'll help you, it'll help prevent you from, again, leading your congregation into some sort of like nonsensical folklore. And it'll help you focus instead on what's the big idea that the passage is actually trying to, uh, to teach people or, or communicate to people. All right. Those are my recommendations. I hope you've gotten some learn something valuable out of this. Uh, if you have, go ahead and give me a like and a follow. Also, I've got some uh, additional things that you can go ahead and click on, other videos, things like that. Um, go ahead and give them a look. All right. It's been a great week, and I hope to talk to you guys again next week.